All right, so we're going to be starting the, the last part, part D, for the peripheral nervous system. If you have questions, please be sure you send me an email. My information is in the information below. Please give the uh, videos a thumbs up if you like it. And please be sure to subscribe. And please let your friends know, and your classmates, about the channel. So let's get going. So in previous lectures, we've talked about uh, sensory receptors. We've talked about uh, motor neurons also. So again, remember, sensory receptors, we're talking about nerves that detect stimuli. Uh, motor neurons, we're talking about nerves that deliver signals that causes uh, a muscle or a gland uh, or um, a, an, an organ to, to do, do some work to, to bring about some type of a change. So, in other words, again, it's, it's signaling uh, another um, tissue to bring about a certain response. Uh, and again, it's going to vary from, from a tissue, one tissue type to another. So again, when you look at cardiac tissue, the response is going to be somewhat different than that uh, compared to if it were, um, I don't know, perhaps tissue that makes up um, your thyroid gland. Um, so similarly, again, when you look at a skeletal muscle, the response is going to be different. Um, so again, you know, we have afferent and efferent fibers that we, al we also discussed. Remember, afferent away from the body, efferent, it's, um, efferent, it's exiting the, the, the brain and the spinal cord. So remember, afferent and efferent fibers, uh, they're delivering impulses to and from the central nervous system. So now we're going to be, in, in terms of moving on with the, uh, with the, um, with the motor system, and now, now we're going to be looking at the, the motor endings. And again, the, the peripheral nervous system, this is where we're going to be um, finding these. Because uh, again, their motor endings are not part of the central nervous system. They're going to be part of the peripheral nervous system. Um, so again, we'll be looking at the, the PNS elements uh, that activate the, the effectors. Again, effectors are any tissue that uh, the, uh, these fibers will uh, supply. And again, this is uh, usually done. This, th this will occur by releasing uh, neurotransmitters. So, uh, so when we talk about where these motor endings are going to be found, so again, we find them in skeletal muscles. We find them in... Uh, around smooth muscle, okay, visceral muscles. So visceral muscles, it could be uh, smooth muscle as well, as well as cardiac muscle, and also we can find them in glands. So when we're looking at the innervation of skeletal muscles, what we're talking about is what occurs at the site when muscles and nerves come together. Again, we've looked at this in the past when we studied uh, the muscle system, skeletal muscle. So again, we have a neuro, neuromuscular junction that's formed over there. So again, think back. If you forgot, go back, review the section on skeletal muscles, and you'll be exposed to this, and you can refresh in your memory. Um, so remember, um, the terminals of somatic mo motor fibers, which innervate these voluntary muscles, again, skeletal muscles, they have these neuromuscular junctions that we find. and um, so again, we have the neuromus uh, neuromuscular junctions on one side. One side we have an effector cell, and the other side we have the effector. So as each axon branch reaches a, a single muscle fiber, the endings, they split into clusters. And again, those clusters we call the axon terminals. Uh, and again, these axon terminals, when you kind of look at it, it's, it looks like a, a branch, okay? that's coming off of a tree, because you have so many of them, there are numerous of them. Um, so again, you're gonna find these over the folds of the sarcolemma of the muscle fiber. And within these axon terminals, again, we find mitochondria and synaptic vesicles. And these synaptic vesicles, they're filled with neurotransmitters. And the neurotransmitter that we find in uh, skeletal muscle at this point, point uh, in this specific location, is uh, acetylcholine, okay? So that's um, symbolized by the capital A, capital C, and lowercase h. So acetylcholine is where we find, uh, it's what we find inside the, the synaptic vesicles, 
and which we find the synaptic vesicles in the axon terminals. So we'll take a look at these in, in a couple of slides later. So we're going to be looking at, uh, as I mentioned in the previous slide, the next slide we'll kind of look at uh, what's going on. And a lot of what's on this slide also will be summarized, or it will be a little bit more clear when you look at it. But essentially, when a nerve impulse, it reaches an axon terminal, acetylcholine gets released by exocytosis, it diffuses across the, the synaptic cleft, and then it attaches to the acetylcholine receptors on the sarcolemma at the junction. So acetylcholine, it ends up binding to these ligand gated channels okay, that we find on the, uh, on the sarcolemma, sarcolemma of the muscle, of the muscle cell. And when acetylcholine binds to these ligand gated channels, it's going to allow both so, uh, sodium and potassium to pass. So more sodium enters the cell than potassium that leaves the cell. And this causes the muscle cell to depolarize. <coughs> Excuse me. So uh, that result, the, the, what results, okay, that this depolarization is what we call this end plate potential. So that end plate potential, it spreads to the adjacent areas of the membrane where it triggers the opening of the voltage-gated uh, sodium channels. And the, you know, the, these events, essentially is what causes an action potential to move along that sar sarcolemma. And again, we call this, the term that we use is uh, pro uh, propagate. So the action potential, it's going to propagate along the sarcolemma, which then st stimulates the, the muscle fibers to contract. So uh, the synaptic cleft at the neuromuscular junction also contains an enzyme called acetylcholine esterase. Okay, so acetylcholine esterase is the enzyme that breaks down acetylcholine. Okay, and when it breaks down acetylcholine, what's going to happen? It's going to end up causing the these ligand gated channels to close. Now we're restricting the amount of sodium that's coming in and the amount of potassium that's that's leaving. So essentially the cell starts to repolarize. Again, it's not going to contract anymore. So when we're looking at this uh, diagram over here, this drawing, this illustration, essentially what we see over here, here's a, a, a motor neuron, okay? And these are, these, this is the muscle over here, okay? Muscle tissue. So again, you can see the sarcolemma that's present here. Now let's look at what happens between the muscle fiber or muscle cell and the axon, so this is the, no, I'm sorry, not the axon, the axon terminal over here, right? So these are the axons in this round part, which they blew up over here, this um, bulb-like uh, structure is the axon terminal. So over here, again, remember, we call this the neuromuscular junction. Okay, so when you look at this term, neuromuscular junction, the junction that happens between the nerve and muscle. So this is what we're looking at over here. This, is blow, this image here is blown up of what we're looking at over here. So here's the muscle and here's the nerve. So at, in, within the axon terminal, you guys know that we have, um, again, if you do not remember, go back to the section that we covered earlier on muscles. And over there, we go into enough detail that hopefully you'll be able to understand uh, if um, again, if it's not very clear over here, because I, I believe it's a little bit more detailed and step by step in the the chapter on muscle. So again, essentially, as that nerve impulse comes down this way to the axon terminal, it opens up these calcium gated channels. Once the calcium gated channels are open up, calcium enters. As calcium enters, remember we have these uh, synaptic vesicles that contain a neurotransmitter, right? So the calcium, it binds, it connects to the, the synaptic vesicles, it pushes it down and it causes it to release its contents and by exercise cytosis, uh, the acetylcholine, okay, acetylcholine is a neurotransmitter that we have inside the synaptic vesicles, it leaves and then it goes to the other side, it goes to the sarcolemma. Now on the sarcolemma, we have these ligand gated channels. Okay. So the acetylcholine, it will bind to these 
ligand-gated channels, and then it causes them to conform uh, a different shape. So these, um, remember, these are transmembrane proteins. So they will change shape, and essentially they open up. Once they open up, sodium enters, and potassium leaves. So as that happens, as sodium is entering and potassium is leaving, what ends up happening is that the inside of the cell becomes depolarized. Okay? Once that happens, then the action potential, it will propagate along the, the sarcolemma, and then it will go down to the sarcoplasmic reticulum, and then it opens up the, um, the, the calcium channels that are over there, and then the muscles can, you guys know the, the steps over there, the power stroke, um, all the different steps that need to take place for muscle contraction to, uh, to, pr to proceed will then ensue. So again, this, these uh, voltage, not voltage, I'm sorry, these ligand-gated channels, they will stay open as long as the acetylcholine binds to them. So in step number six, it tells you that there is another enzyme, and this enzyme is called acetylcholine esterase. Acetylcholine esterase, they will come and they will pick up these acetylcholine, and then they end up sending them back to the synaptic, to the um, axon terminal where they get reused. So once acetylcholine comes in and, and moves away, these um, returns the, in other words, it, uh, it breaks the bond between the, uh, the, the ligand-gated channels, the receptors on these ligand-gated channels, and the acetylcholine. At that point, when the acetylcholine is removed, then the, the doors are closed, or the gates close. So then what ends up happening is the, the cell, will, now you end up having sodium's not going inside and potassium's not leaving. So then the membrane will then repolarize, okay? So again, when the gates open up, the membrane depolarizes, and when it closes, it will repolarize. The junctions that we find between autonomic motor endings and their effectors being smooth muscle and cardiac muscle and glands are much simpler than the junctions that are formed between the somatic fibers and skeletal muscle cells. The, uh, the autonomic motor axons, they branch repeatedly and each branch ends up forming what they call a synapse in passing, or essentially it means synapse, synapses in passing. Um, so, yeah, as these um, autonomic uh, motor axons, they branch, they end up forming these uh, synapses in passing with their effector cells. And what, what we see is that, you know, instead of what the, the, the bulb-like terminals we saw at the neuromuscular junctions, um, the axon endings that serve smooth muscles or, or gland, they, have, they don't have these bulb-like um, axon terminals. Instead, they have a series of what we call varicosities. And we'll look at a picture, in, in the, I believe, in the next slide. But, you know, they, they have a knob-like swelling. This is what kind of looks like. And inside, you know, it's the same thing. We have mitochondria and synaptic vesicles uh, that we find within it. And again, if you kind of, another way to think about them, some people describe them as being um, like a string of beads. Um, so moving along, the, the synaptic, uh, the autonomic synaptic vesicles, typically in terms of neurotransmitter, they either have acetylcholine or uh, norepinephrine. Sometimes, you know, we find both acetyl uh, acetylcholine and norepinephrine. Uh, so again, both of these, they act uh, on their targets as uh, second messengers. So with that said, uh, visceral motor responses, they tend to be slower than those that are induced by the somatic motor fibers. And somatic motor fibers, as we looked at it in the previous slide, uh, they directly open up ion channels. So over here in this photograph, again, we're, what we're looking at is uh, these are smooth muscle cells over here. And then if you kind of look at it, this kind of looks like a beads that are on a string. So again, um, this is what we said before, you know, they call these uh, the synapses in passing or the synapses in, in passant. So 
Uh, again, when you zoom in on this, what do we find? Again, we have these knob-like swellings over here within them. Uh, again, these knob-like swellings, they're called the, they're not called axon terminals. Again, these are referred to as varicosities. So within the varicosities, we have the mitochondria, and then we have the, the green things that you see here. These are the synaptic uh, vesicles. So again, inside the synaptic vesicles, there's either norepinephrine or acetylcholine as the neurotransmitter. While the cerebral cortex is at the highest level of our conscious motor pathways, um, it's not the ultimate planner and coordinator of complex motor behaviors. Um, so complex motor activities like walking and swimming depends on more complex patterns. And we end up defining um, three levels of motor control. So th those are the the segmental level, the projection level, and the pre-command level. In this schematic over here, when you look at it, um, you're talking about the levels of motor control and their interactions. So as you go down from here, you know, we start off with the, the lowest to the highest. Um, in, in, and again, so this is a hierarchy. So when you look over here, essentially, uh, this, these are just reflexes. Right? That's about it. Now, as you start to move up, when you get to the so that's segment, segmental level. That's primarily talking about reflexes that occur over here. As we start going up, now we're having more brain involvement that's taking place. So at the projection level, again, the motor cortex, pyramidal pathways, um, reticular formations, vestibular, these are all playing a role. And then as we go to the highest level, again, this is the pre-command level. Now we have the, the cerebellum. So again, we're having a lot more um, a lot more feedback, a lot more, a lot more instruction that's, uh, that's taking place in order for these commands to be carried about. Starting off with the segmental level, which is the lowest level of um, the motor hierarchy, uh, it's made up of reflexes and spinal cord circuits that control automatic movements. The, so a segmental circuit activates a network of ventral horn neurons in a group of cord segments. And this causes them to stimulate a specific group of muscles. Um, circuits that control locomotion and other specific and repeated motor activities are called central pattern generators, okay? or CPGs. So CP, CPGs, they're made up of uh, a network of inhibitory and excitatory neurons, and they end up setting rhythms and alternating patterns of movement. On to the projection level. Um, so we know the spinal cord is under the direct control of uh, the projection level of motor control. So the projection level, uh, it's made up of neurons acting through uh, both direct and indirect motor pathways, which end up using descending projection fibers. So the upper motor neurons of the motor cortex, they initiate the direct, or again, uh, the, the direct pathways. We also refer to them as the uh, pyrimidial pathways. Uh, axons of the direct pathway neurons, they produce discrete voluntary movements of the skeletal muscles. Okay, so these are discrete voluntary movements. Um, the brainstem motor nuclei oversees the indirect pathway. Okay? So axons of these, uh, of these pathways, they help control reflexes and the CPG controlled motor actions, modifying and controlling the activity of the segmental apparatus. Um, so the projection motor pathways, they convey information to lower motor neurons, as well as sending a copy of that information as internal feedback to the higher command levels. So this essentially what it's doing is it's continu continually, constantly informing, uh, informing them of what's supposed to be happening. The two other systems of brain neurons that we find in the cerebellum and basal nuclei regulate motor activity. So they precisely star, start or stop movements 
they coordinate movement with posture, be able to block unwanted movement, as well as monitor muscle tone. Collectively, again, they're called the, the pre-command areas. Okay? So uh, again, these systems, they control outputs of the cortex and, uh, and brainstem centers. And, um, and they, they're all the way on top. You know, they stand at the highest level of the, the, uh, the motor hierarchy. When we talk about the, the key center for live sensory motor integration and control, we're talking about the, the cerebellum. Okay. Uh, the cerebellum, however, doesn't have a direct connection to the spinal cord. It acts on motor pathways through the projection area, uh, through the projection areas of the, the brain stem and on the motor cortex. Uh, via the thalamus to fine tune the uh, motor activities. Moving on to the basal nuclei, uh, the basal nuclei receives inputs from all cortical areas and, uh, and sends their output back mainly to premotor and prefrontal cortical areas via the thalamus. So compared to the cerebellum, the basal nuclei appear to be involved in more complex aspects of motor control. In, um, under resting conditions, the basal nuclei inhibit various motor centers of the brain. Uh, when the mo motor centers are, uh, are released from inhibition, co coordinated motions uh, can then begin. And this slide here, again, is just showing you where we find these different levels. So again, the lowest of the levels is the segmental level. Uh, as we move up, to the middle part, then we have the projection levels over here, and then the highest levels, again, we have the, the cerebellum and the, the basal nuclei. So this is the pre-command level over here. Okay, so this is our highest, and again, the, the key players in the pre-command level are the cerebellum and the basal nuclei. For the projection level, we have the primary motor cortex and the brain stem nuclei that we have. And then for the segmental level, it's just spinal cord. Many of the body's control systems are reflexes. And reflexes can be either inborn or they can be learned. An inborn, or another term for this, is intrinsic. Okay. So inborn or intri intrinsic reflex. This is a rapid, predictable motor response to a stimulus. So it's unlearned, it's unpremeditated, and it's involuntary. And it's built into our neural anatomy. So reflexes, they prevent us from having to think about all the little details of staying, for example, uh, staying upright or intact and alive, helping us maintain posture, avoid pain. And in addition to that, control the visceral activities. So, you know, for inborn reflexes, for example, you know, you pick up a, a hot pot of water by mistake. Uh, now, what's going to happen? You know, you touch it, you don't, you're not thinking that the pot was hot or the cup was hot. You're going to open your hand up and let it go and it's going to drop. So, this would be an example of an inborn or an intrinsic reflex. The second type of reflex is a, what we call an acquired reflex, or and you can say it's a learned reflex. And a uh, you know, learned re re reflex, okay, as the name implies, it results from practice or repetition. So you, know, you can take, for example, you know, you know, as they have put down over here, driving. Okay? So the skills that you need for requiring uh, the process is, you know, it's, it's largely automatic, but only because you, know, you ended up investing a lot of time and effort uh, to acquire these skills to drive. Same thing could be said for a sport. If you're an athlete, uh, basketball, right? You know, you go, you practice, and you, you shoot the basket every day for two hours during practice. And again, constantly doing this over and over and over again, you naturally build reflexes in what to do in certain situations. Um, so, yeah, th these are all learned or acquired reflexes. 
So, you know, again, in reality, the distinction between inborn and learned reflexes is not very clear cut. And a lot of inborn reflexes, um, you know, the, the actions, these inborn reflex actions, you know, you can end up modifying, uh, modifying them by learning and, and conscious effort. So, for example, you know, when, we, when I spoke about dropping a hot cup of water, uh, you, know, you pick something up and that mug is really hot, you just let it go and it falls, right? This is an inborn or an intrinsic reflex. However, you know, imagine if you have, um, if, if your cat or, or dog or, or your child was sitting next to you uh, and you did that same action, you picked up that hot cup, most likely, again, because you're consciously aware that, you know, there is another being in very close proximity to you that would result in harm from, from this re act of letting go of that cup, you're likely not going to let go of that cup. You know, you're know, you probably going to set it down uh, back from wherever you picked it up from. So when you look at the, 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 comp the parts of a reflex arc, arc here are the components of the reflex arc. Um, and we also refer to this as a neural pathway. There's about five things that we, that we have. So uh, again, the very first thing is a receptor. And again, receptor is the site of where the stimulus is received. Okay? So this is the site of the stimulus action. That's a receptor. And that receptor is going to be connected to a nerve cell. And that nerve cell is going to be of a sensory type. So you're talking about a sensory neuron. So a sensory neuron then transmits afferent impulses to the CNS. Remember, afferent, A-F-F-E-R-E-N-T. Afferent is signals away from the body. Okay. So this is the job for the sensory neuron. Next thing is we have an integration center. And at the integration center, is it's going to be perhaps a simple reflex arc. So the integration center may be a single synapse between the sensory neuron and the motor neuron. If that's the case, we call that a monosynaptic, okay? uh, a monosynaptic reflex. Sometimes we have more complex ref reflex arcs that involve multiple synapses with uh, chains of interneurons. And that is what we call a polysynaptic uh, reflex. Okay? So the fourth component for a reflex arc, of course, is a motor neuron. And motor neurons, they conduct efferent impulses from the integration center to an effector organ. Okay, So motor neurons, they conduct efferent impulses. Efferent, E like Edward, E-F-F-E-R-E-N-T. Okay, efferent, it is exiting signals that are exiting the CNS, okay? Exiting brain and spinal cord. That is what the direction of information is moving, the impulses are moving in a motor neuron. And then the last component for a reflex arc, of course, is the effector, okay? And the effector could be either a muscle fiber or a gland cell that re responds to this efferent signal or this efferent impulse it receives and again it responds by either contracting or secreting uh, some chemical component in terms of the functional classification of reflexes functionally they're classified as either being somatic or autonomic so in uh, a somatic reflex you know if it ends up activating skeletal muscle then that's a somatic reflex the autonomic reflexes, again, they're also referred to as visceral reflexes. And again, viscera are the internal organs. So again, they, visceral reflexes, they're going to be activating either tissue such as uh, glands, smooth muscle, or heart muscle. Okay? So everything that um, you don't have conscious control of would be regulated by autonomic reflexes, things that you're not able to perceive, let, let me put it that way. Um, yeah, autonomic reflexes will trigger tissues and glands, tissues, 
that you're not able to perceive. So again, you, know, you can feel your muscles contracting. You know when your muscles of, the, of the, your, your hands are contracting. Right? You're, you're consciously aware of that. But again, uh, if you know, your smooth muscles of your blood vessels start, start to contract or relax, you, you, you will not know. You know. You're not consciously aware. Or when your, uh, your uh, adrenal gland, for example, it, it's, it, get, it starts to secrete uh, hormones. You're not consciously aware of that either. So again, um, somatic reflexes pertain to skeletal muscle, whereas autonomic or visceral reflexes, they pertain to the viscera, okay? Again, when you look at this uh, schematic over here, essentially what we're looking at are the five components of the reflex arc. And again, the first one, number one, is you know you have receptors, so again, within the, the epidermis, and uh, we have these tactile discs that you find, um, and then they are connected to, number two, a sensory neuron, okay? The sensory neuron then goes to the integration center, okay, in this case it's showing it's a spinal cord, and then the integration center then is, has the fourth part to it, it gets uh, connected or comes into contact with a motor neuron, and the motor, motor neuron then will relay this information to the effector, in this case, you know, we're talking about a skeletal muscle, okay, so again, receptor, sensor neuron, integration center, motor neuron, and then finally, uh, we have the uh, effector. So again, this is a example of a uh, somatic reflex. Okay, so again, functionally, this would be an example of a somatic reflex. Why? Because we're looking at skeletal muscle that's being activated. Many of the spinal reflexes occur without the direct involvement of the higher brain centers. So, you know, they've you know, seen in, in animals uh, whose brains are destroyed. And as long as the spinal cord is still functional, we still have spinal reflexes that occurred. Um, however, the brain is advised by most spinal activity, and it can facilitate, inhibit, or adapt, depending on the circumstance. Uh, in addition to that, the continuous facilitation, or the continuous facilitating signals from the brain are needed for normal spinal reflex activities. Uh, in terms of uh, testing, so tests of uh, somatic reflexes clinically are important in order to assess the condition of the nervous system. So, you know, if we have exaggerated, uh, distorted, or absent reflexes, uh, this could be indicative of degeneration or pathology of specific nervous system regions. Uh, and again, a lot of times, you know, they end up um, up in these uh, these deficits. They they come about. They could be tested before other signs and symptoms uh, may appear. Uh, the most commonly assessed reflexes again are going to be the stretch, the flexor, and the superficial reflexes. In terms of stretch and tendon reflexes, they help your nervous system smoothly coordinate the activities of your skeletal muscles. And in order to do this, two types of information about the current state of the muscle are needed. And that's going to be muscle length and amount of tension in the muscle. So um, in terms of the length of the muscle, the information comes from muscle spindles in the skeletal muscles. And for the amount of tension in the muscle and uh, its associated tendons, tendon organs provide this information. Taking a quick look at the, the functional anatomy of the muscle spindles, each muscle spindle is made up of three to 10 modified skeletal muscle fibers that are called intrafusal muscle fibers and we find it enclosed in a connective tissue capsule. The fibers that are less than a quarter the size of the effector fibers of the muscles, which are called the extrafusal muscle fibers. The central regions of the intrafusal fibers, they don't have any myofilaments 
So therefore, they're non-contractile. And these regions are the receptive surfaces of the spindles. We have two types of afferent endings that send sensory inputs to the central nervous system. Okay, and that, and that's going to be either annulo spiral endings or it's going to be flower spray endings. Okay. Annulo spiral endings are also referred to as primary sensory endings, whereas the flower spray endings are also referred to as the secondary sensory endings. For the first type, the annulo spiral endings or the primary sensory endings, these are the endings of large axons that wrap around the spindle center. And um, they end up being stimulated by both the rate and the degree of the stretch. Okay. So both rate and stretch degree are the factors that stimulate them. As for the second type, the secondary sensory endings or the flower spray endings, um, they are formed by the smaller axons that supply the spindle ends. And they get stimulated only by the degree of the stretch. As for the intrafusal muscle fibers, they have contra uh, contractile regions at their ends. And this is the only area that contains actin and myosin filaments. These regions, they're innervated by gamma. There we go. Gamma. This is uh, the Greek symbol for gamma. And in case you don't know, this is the Greek symbol for alpha. So the efferent fibers, these gamma efferent fibers, they arise from small motor neurons in the ventral horn of the spinal cord. The, the gamma motor fibers, they maintain spindle sensitivity and are different from another type of fiber we find called the alpha efferent fibers of the large alpha motor neurons that stimulate the extra fusal muscle fibers to contract. Now, whenever the muscle spindle is stretched, its associated sensory neurons transmit impulses at higher frequencies to the spinal cord. This picture over here, we can see the anatomy of this, uh, the spindle and the tendon organ. So this is the tendon over here. Of course, tendons are connected to muscles. So we have over here the tendon organ, and you can see the sensory fiber being found over here. And the next thing that we see is again, that the muscle has been dissected to reveal the intrafusal muscle fibers that we find. And coming from these intra, uh, intrafusal muscle fibers, um, again, externally, we have extrafusal muscle fibers, okay? So external to the ones that are inside, internal. So what do we have over here? Well, we see a lot of nerves, essentially. So this right over here, this is this flower spray ending, okay, or the secondary sensory endings that we have over here, okay? And you can see where they're attached to, where they come into contact with. The, the ones in blue, this would be the, oh, let me go back, okay, so this would be the annulo spiral or the primary endings that we have. The efferent, the gamma fibers are these guys over here in red, okay? So this is the gamma fibers. Um, so these over here, so I guess, is this red or this would be another color, I don't know, perhaps it's fuchsia, if you can call it. Uh, this looks more like a red or an orange, anyways, regardless of the color. This is an alpha efferent motor fiber. Okay, so again, the alpha, uh, the alpha fibers or the alpha efferent fibers, can we find them uh, delivering to the extrafusal muscle fibers over that we can see over here. Okay, so, and again, you can see the, so the, this, um, you can see the connective tissue capsule, that's also, that we find surrounding this muscle spindle. So this is essentially, a, this is anatomy uh, of muscle spindles and the, the tendon organ. The muscle spindle is stretched and excited in one of two ways by either applying an external force that's gonna lengthen the entire muscle, 
such as when we're carrying something heavy or when an, uh, when an antagonistic muscle contracts. This is what's referred to as the external stretch. Okay? The other way is by activating the gamma motor neurons that stimulate the distal ends of the intrafusal fibers to contract, thereby stretching the middle of the spindle. And this is what we call the internal stretch. And whenever the muscle spindle is stretched, its associated sensory neurons transmit impulses at a higher frequency to the spinal cord. So well, again, translating what we've discussed uh, over the past handful of slides, essentially what we're saying is uh, when you look at this as a function in terms of number of act action potentials uh, and time in terms of the degree of stretch, the more you stretch, the greater the stretch that you get, uh, the number of action potentials essentially is going to be, it will increase, okay? So again, stretching activates a muscle spindle and it increase, increases the rate of the action potentials. And this is what essentially each one of these lines is representing. As time goes by, the stretch increases the number of stimuli that's being sent out or the number of action potentials that's being, uh, that's stimuli, I'm sorry, the number of action potentials that's being uh, generated by the stretch. During voluntary skeletal muscle contraction, the muscle shortens. If the intrafusal muscle fibers didn't contract along with the extrafusal fibers, the muscle spindle would go slack and would stop generating action potentials. At this point, it wouldn't be able to signal further changes in the muscle length, so it would be useless. To deal with this, we have alpha gamma coactivation that prevents this from happening. Descending fibers of motor pathways synapse with both the alpha and gamma motor neurons so that the motor impulses are simultaneously sent to the large extrafusal fibers and to the muscle spindle intrafusal fibers. Stimulating the intrafusal fibers maintains the spindle's tension and sensitivity during muscle contraction. Uh, this, uh, in this way, the, the brain continues to be notified of changes in the muscle length. So, you know, without this information about changes in the muscle length, um, for example, you wouldn't be able to walk on the edge of um, the sidewalk. So again, in this uh, picture over here, in this drawing, uh, they're showing that if only these alpha motor neurons are activated, you only get the extrafusal muscles to, to contract. And again, when you look over here, what ends up happening? The muscle ends up becoming, uh, the, the spindles become slack. And again, you end up getting no action potentials that are fired. So therefore, we need both alpha gamma coactivation. So in, in this way, both the extrafusal muscle fibers as well as the muscle spindles, they contract. Okay. So again, tension ends up being maintained in the muscle spindle and it can still signal changes in its length. By sending commands to the motor neurons, the brain essentially sets a muscle's length, and the stretch reflex makes sure that the muscle stays at that length. So take for example the patellar or the knee jerk reflex. This is a stretch reflex that helps keep our knees from buckling when, we st when we're standing upright. So as our knees begin to buckle and the quadriceps lengthen, the stretch reflex causes the quadriceps to contract without us having to think about it. Not only is the stretch reflex important for maintaining muscle tone, it's also important for adjusting it reflexively. It's most important in the large extensor muscles that sustain upright posture and in postural muscles of the trunk. So, for example, um, the stretch reflex is initiated first on one side of the spine and then on the other. Regulate contractions of the postural muscles of the spine almost continuously. Now let's look at how stretch reflex works. So when stretch activates sensory neurons of muscle spindles, they transmit impulses at a higher frequency to the spinal cord. There, the sensory neurons synapse directly with alpha motor neurons, which rapidly excite the extrafusal muscle fibers of the stretched muscle. And the reflexive muscle contractions that follow resist further muscle stretching. So the branches of the afferent fibers also synapse with interneurons that inhibit 
motor neurons controlling antagonistic muscles. And the resulting inhibition is what we call reciprocal inhibition. Consequently, the, the stretch stimulus causes the antagonists to relax so that they can't resist the shortening of the stretched muscle caused by the main reflex arc. So while this spinal reflex is occurring, information on the muscle's length and the speed of muscle shortening is being relayed to the higher brain centers. Another thing to know is that all stretch reflexes are monosynaptic and ipsilateral. In other words, they involve a single synapse and motor activity on the same side of the body. While stretch reflexes are the only monosynaptic reflexes in the body, even in these reflexes, the part of the reflex arc that in inhibits the motor neuron serving the antagonistic muscle is polysynaptic. So let's take a look at the events by which muscle stretch is damped. So what do we have over here? We've got uh, a couple of pair of muscles. You have an agonist and an, uh, an antagonist muscle. So when stretch activates muscle spindles, the associated sensory neuron, in this case this is blue one, transmits impulses at a higher frequency. Right? So this is this afferent neuron. So this afferent neuron, it goes to the cell body. Uh, this is the cell body of this sensory neuron to the spinal cord and at the spinal cord this afferent neuron the sensory neuron is going to directly synapse with this alpha motor neuron okay so this is this efferent neuron and we have two efferent neurons over here one is uh, th this red one the other is this purple one this one this is this alpha motor neuron okay now the sensory neuron it also will synapse with an interneuron so here's this interneuron right over here Okay, this is in green. So the interneuron, uh, it forms a synapse. It can inhibit the motor neuron by controlling this antagonistic muscle. Okay? So these afferent impulses uh, will go to the, this antagonist muscle. So let's take a look at this uh, knee jerk reflex. So there's one, two, essentially, three steps, more or less. Uh, the first step, again, we, we tap the patellar ligament. Now we got two muscles, so here we have the patellar ligament, we have the quadricep muscle, which is an extensor muscle, and then we have a flexor muscle, which are, which are the, the hamstring muscle, the muscles that make up the hamstring over here. So tapping this patellar ligament stretches the quadriceps and it excites its muscle spindles, okay? What, what does this do? Well, this ends up, here as these muscle spindles are stretched, it's gonna end up sending a signal out, right? So these are the afferent impulses that go to the spinal cord. Now, it synapses with a motor neuron, okay, over here, that's this part, and it also synapses with an interneuron. So let's look at this part first, what's happening over here. So the motor neuron sends efferent signals, activating signals, uh, to the quadricep, and it causes it to contract, and you, you kick out, okay? You extend your knee, you kick your foot outwards. Now, in 3B, the interneurons make inhibitory synapse with the ventral horn neurons that prevent the antagonist muscles from resisting the contraction of the quadricep. So essentially, here we go, right over here. We have this uh, interneuron here, and it's connected to this, um, to the, this, uh, this purple, this ventral horn effector uh, neuron, which goes and supplies the antagonist muscle, which in this case, it's the, uh, the, the hamstrings. So this is gonna resist the contraction of the, the quadriceps when uh, this ends up being stimulated. The motor supply to the muscle spindle allows the brain to voluntarily modify the stretch reflex response and the firing rate of the motor neurons. When the gamma neurons are vigorously stimulated by impulses from the brain, the spindle is stretched and highly sensitive, and the muscle contraction force is either maintained or increased. When the gamma motor neurons are inhibited, the spindle resembles a loose rubber band and is non-responsive, and the extrafusal muscles relax. 
So the ability to modify the stretch reflex is important in a lot of situations. As the speed and difficulty of a movement increases, the brain increases the gamma motor output to make the muscle spindles more sensitive. So um, the sensitivity is very important when balanced reflexes must be very precise. And this is the case for certain athletes like a gymnast, for example, uh, that's on a balance beam. So as stretch reflexes cause muscle contraction in response to increased muscle length, the polysynaptic tendon reflexes produce exactly the opposite effect. Muscles relax and lengthen in response to tension. When muscle tension increases substantially during contraction or passive stretching, high threshold tendon organs may be activated. Afferent impulses are first transmitted to the spinal cord and then to the cerebellum where the information is used to adjust muscle tension. At the same time, motor neurons in the spinal cord circuits supplying the contracting muscles are inhibited and antagonist muscles are activated. This is what we call reciprocal activation. As a result, the contracting muscle relaxes and its uh, antagonist is activated. So again, when we're looking over here is that sometimes when you have, when the muscle tension increases, again, substantially, and these tendon organs get activated, then we end up initiating this tendon reflex. So what ends up happening is, again, uh, this afferent neuron uh, will send a signal and it will go to the spinal cord. Now at the same time, remember, the signal is going to the brain as well, but let's look at, we're looking at this reflex over here. Essentially what's gonna end up happening is this. Now we have uh, two neurons, um, two interneurons over here, okay? So the first one, this first interneuron over here, the one that's in red, it will be inhibited. So the, this is the muscle, okay, this quadricep, this is where the threshold went up really high. So at that, uh, so what's gonna end up happening is, this is gonna cause this muscle not to contract. Okay, so it's gonna inhibit the signal. However, on the other hand, what's gonna end up happening is, the, 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 this uh, efferent signal is gonna go to the antagonist muscle, and it's gonna cause it to contract. Okay, so essentially that's what's happening, and you have two uh, neurons, two efferent neurons, one will get inhibited, and the one that gets inhibited is the one that's coming from the agonist, and the antagonist will then be um, stimulated to cause it to, or it's gonna be excited to cause it to contract. So a painful stimulates what's called the flexor reflex or withdrawal reflex. Um, so this causes automatic withdrawal of the threatened body part from the stimulus. Now, flexor reflexes, they're either ipsilateral or polysynaptic. So when several muscles must be recruited to withdraw the injured body part, then we're looking at it being polysynaptic. Um, flexor reflexes are, are, are protective and they're also important to our survi survival. Uh, they're able to override the spinal pathways and prevent other reflexes from using them at the same time. However, like other spinal reflexes, descending signals from the brain can override flexor reflexes. So this happens, you know, the example that they give is, uh, you know, when we're expecting a painful stimulus, like we're about to get blood taken out by a lab technician from a, a vein. Uh, so again, the brain, it ends up overriding us, pulling our arm away, knowing that we're still about to get pricked by the needle. Next, we look at the crossed extensor reflex. So the crossed extensor reflex often accompanies the flexor reflex in weight-bearing limbs, and it's particularly important in maintaining balance. Um, it's a complex spinal reflex. It's consist of an ipsilateral withdrawal reflex and a contralateral extensor reflex. Uh, incoming afferent fibers, they synapse with interneurons that control the flexor withdrawal response on the same side of the body, 
and with other interneurons that control the extensor muscles on the opposite side. The crossed extensor reflex is obvious when we, for example, we step barefoot on broken glass. The ipsilateral response causes you to quickly lift your leg up, the, the leg that you stepped onto the glass with, while the contralateral response activates the extensor muscles of your opposite leg to support the weight suddenly that's been shifted to it. So the crossed extensor reflex also occurs when someone unexpectedly grabs your arm. That grasped arm is withdrawn as the opposite arm pushes you away from the attacker. So when we look at this uh, drawing over here, we're looking at the, the crossed extensor reflex. So let's see what's going on here. Someone comes and grabs your arm. So what's the response? Naturally, you're going to be flexing your arm, right? You're going to pull your arm away. So this is that, um, this is this, uh, the ipsilateral, okay, it's on the same side. So this is the ipsilateral withdrawal that's taking place. And again, this happens as the afferent uh, neuron sends a signal to, and that goes to the spinal cord. And from the spinal cord, we have an inhibitory and then we have an excitatory. So what's being inhibited? When you look over here, in order to flex your arm, the triceps are inhibited and the biceps, they are excited and this causes flexion to take place, right? Now, at the same time that this is happening, at the same time, we have an interneuron that's going to the opposite side of the body as well, okay? So this is the contralateral, okay? Contralateral extensor reflex that's taking place. And what ends up happening over here? On this part, now, Again, the interneurons, they come and now the, the, trice, the, 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 the biceps will be inhibited and then the triceps, the, the efferent fibers that go to the triceps end up causing contraction to, again, push away from that person. Moving on to superficial reflexes. Superficial reflexes come from gentle cutaneous stimulation. So if you take a tongue depressor and you stroke the skin with it, this is an example of superficial, uh, of a superficial reflex. Um, these are clinically important reflexes and these reflexes, they depend both on the functional upper motor pathways and on cord level reflex arcs. The best known Superficial reflexes are the abdominal and plantar reflexes. When it comes to the plantar reflex, we're looking at, we're looking to test the integrity of the spinal cord from L4 to S2. And indirectly, we're trying to determine if the cortical spinal tracts are functioning properly. Now, in order to elicit a plantar reflex, we take a blunt object and we drag it from the heel to the toe along the lateral aspect of the plantar surface of the foot. Okay. So when we do that, the normal response is for the toes to flex downwards. In other words, your, your toes curl. Okay. Now, if the primary motor cortex or the cortical, uh, the cortical spinal tract is damaged, then the plantar reflex ends up being replaced by an abnormal reflex, and we call that this Babinski sign. And in the Bobinski sign, what ends up happening is the, the, gro the great toe, it ends up dorsiflexing. And in other words, the hallux, okay? Remember your big toe is called the hallux. This is the correct medical term for it. You shouldn't have to be using the term great toe anymore by this point. Um, so the hallux is gonna dorsiflent, dorsiflex, and the smaller toes, the remaining digits, the four digits, they will fan laterally. Now, in infants, it's normal for them to exhibit this Babinski sign until they're about a year old because their nervous systems, they're incompletely myelinated. Moving on to the abdominal reflex. So when you stroke the skin of the lateral abdomen above and to the side or below the umbilicus, it ends up inducing a reflex contraction of the abdominal muscles in which the umbilicus moves towards that stimulated site. 
These reflexes, again, they're called abdominal reflexes, and we're checking the integrity of the spinal cord and ventral rami from T8 to T12. Okay. Abdominal reflexes, they vary in intensity from one person to another. However, their absence indicates lesions in the corticospinal tract. So that's all for this lecture. Thank you so much for watching. If you guys have questions, be sure to email me. And uh, enjoy the rest of your, your day or your night.